Okay, so if you go back to what we had done yesterday, just uh, go over it slightly, we were looking at the fermion gases. Now we had already obtained the uh, basic ingredients that we will be using, so we know how the chemical potential changes as a function of temperature, both at low temperature limit and at high temperature limit. The reason why we are looking at the, these two limits is uh, they are easy to evaluate, first of all. Secondly, for typ typically the Fermi energy of a given system is at the order, Fermi temperature is at the order of 10 to the power 4 Kelvin, so which is much larger than typical temperatures that we are working in. So the a low temperature limit is more relevant for the everyday life, let's say. The room temperature is much below the uh, Fermi temperature. So it's, it would be, the relevant contribution would be the low temperature limit. And then we were looking at the problem, how does this electron gas behave in, in a magnetic field? So basically there will be two contributions. One is from the spin. If we have a spin, the magnetic uh, dip, the, since electrons have a spin, they have a magnetic dipole moment. And since they have a magnetic dipole moment, they will be aligning with the magnetic field if you put it in a magnetic field. But of course, the temperature, the thermal fluctuation will uh, try to spoil this alignment. The so we have these two effects, the temperature uh, just randomizing the orientation plus the magnetic field trying to align all of them. And plus there is the quantum mechanical effect, that especially at low temperature, which tries to, which doesn't allow two electrons to be in the same state, meaning the same momentum state, special wave function, and the same spin state. And the first observation that basically led us to all the remaining parts is that if you put it in a magnetic field, the spin up and the energies of spin up and the spin down will be shifted. But still, the Fermi level for both the spin up and the spin down will be the same. So up to a given total energy level, there will be more states that have their spin aligned with the magnetic field, because the magnetic field lowers their energy, and then the, uh, the number of states whose spin is anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And since the number of part, uh, electrons with spin in one direction is different than the number of electrons with spin in the opposite direction, or the magnetic dipole, instead of spin, just use the magnetic dipole, the number of uh, electrons with a magnetic dipole moment pointing in the direction of the magnetic field will be more, and hence there will be a net magnetization of the system there will be a net magnetic dipole moment. Magnetization is defined as the uh, magnet, uh, mag the dipole moment per unit volume. So that's why here we are, we are looking at M over V. And this magnetic susceptibility is how the magnetization uh, uh, changes as a function of P. And in the low, we are at low B limit, it's easier to evaluate. Now, the first thing we looked at was what happens at zero temperature, because that's the easiest to evaluate. We don't have these uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution. It just becomes a, a step function. So we first evaluated the number of, uh, let's say, number of electrons with spin in the same direction as the magnetic field and the number of the spins in the opposite direction, the difference just gives us the magnetization. Now at finite temperature, now we, uh, we switch to the, uh, rather than using the canon grand canonical ensemble, we are using the micro canonical ensemble, uh, no, sorry, the grand, rather than the canonical, we are the grand canonical, we are using the uh, canonical. Now the main problem is, what up? so we have these two different systems, the spin-up the systems made up of spin-up electrons and the system made up of spin-down electrons. So do they have the same chemical potential? So rather than avoiding this question, we just went to the canonical ensemble. And uh, we said that, okay, so the problem is just summing over all the microstates. The crucial approximation here was when we converted to such a sum over the number of uh, spins aligned with the magnetic field. There are many terms in that sum. We just picked up the term that is the largest because with the, all these huge uh, microscopic numbers, only the largest term contributes, the other terms are negligible. 
and then we obtain that the chemical potentials of these two systems. Okay, just uh, one word of caution here. You see, mu zero is not the chemical potential of electrons in a magnetic field. Since these two systems are in equilibrium, they should have the same, exactly the same chemical potential. But what mu zero is, is that mu zero is the chemical potential of the electrons and the, uh, the spin up electrons and spin down electrons in the absence of the magnetic field. And that is just two, twice, well, this is mu star B. Well, that, this is not a, a great, I say. We could have, in fact, just say that straight away, because in the absence of the magnet, uh, you say we have this Fermi level, the chemical potential is equal in the presence of the magnetic field. If we remove the magnetic field, the, the energy of these elect electrons at the Fermi level, at the chemical potential, one of them will be shifted up by mu star b, the other one will be shifted by mu star minus mu star b. And hence, in the absence of the magnetic field, the chemical potentials of these two systems will be, should, have, should differ by 2 mu star b. And just another word of caution, we are not actually removing the magnetic field. We are just saying that suppose we ha have this system with a magnetic field. So the electrons are in equilibrium, the chemical potentials are the same, etc. All the system is set. And now we ask the chemical potential of spin-up particles, what is the contribution from the magnetic field? And the chemical potential of the spin-down particles, what is the contribution from the magnetic field? If we remove those contributions, what we obtain is mu zero. And they differ by 2 mu star b. And it just turns out that <coughs> then we define this quantity r. r will be basically what will determine our magnetization. It's the difference between the, uh, well, it, we can just write this as n plus minus n minus over n. It's the same thing. It's the difference in the numbers of spin up electrons and the spin down electrons. So R, the magnetization will be proportional to R. And then we had seen that R is actually, is proportional to B, this is new star, and inversely proportional to the derivative of this mu zero. And okay, so this is M, the magnetization is proportional to R. We know what the value of R is, and then we obtain the magnetization. Well, you see, this expression is valid at all temperatures. The only approximation we did uh, up to here is that B is small. There is a small B, and hence R is small and we made a Taylor expansion over here in terms of R. That's the only approximation we did. So this is the magnetization of my, the uh, small b limit of the magnetization of my electron gas, whatever the temperature is. Then the next question is, what is mu zero as a function of the uh, number of particles and the densities? And we, uh, okay, so this is basically our final result with the first pro correction. This is that uh, small temperature limit. Now, one thing is, uh, this is positive. So the magnetization is in the same direction as the applied magnetic field. This, this is the paramagnetism. This is called Pauli. Well, I, I always get confused about which one is para, which one is diamagnetism. One way I come up with to remember is just think of dielectrics. So it's a dielectric. What happens in a dielectric is that the induced electric dipole moment is opposite to the direction of the electric field. The electric field is reduced inside the dielectric. This is the, let's say, the normal behavior. The abnormal behavior or paranormal behavior would be to have an electric field larger than the applied electric field or in this case, the magnetic field larger than the applied magnetic field. <coughs> so that's why it's, uh, it's not normal, which is paranormal, and hence paramagnetic. But I think paramagnetic is the normal one, in this case. In, in, in the magnetization case, yes. 
Es tie alaini un tev tādā ipoli būtu. And then uh, we were looking at the question, the next question would be, what about the translational motion? You see, this is the alignment of the dipole moment. But the electrons are also moving around. If you put your system in a magnetic field, that means the system is, you're actually creating a changing magnetic field in the system. So there will be an induced EMF in the system. So if you are changing the magnetic field without moving the system, then you are creating an electric field which is inducing the EMF. Or if you can also have this magnetic field constant, but you are moving your system into this region of magnetic field, and hence you are inducing a motional EMF. But whatever picture you have, in both cases you are inducing an EMF, if you put your system in a magnetic field, and this EMF will change the speed of the electrons, will create currents. And it turns out that this effect opposes the uh, magnetic field. So this is a diamagnetic effect. This is Landau diamagnetism. So the electrons inside the magnetic field will be basically going around circular orbits inside the magnetic field. And well, we had this simple picture, let's say, of the Bohr quantization condition, which just, uh, I mean, you can just grasp the uh, qualitative behavior, although quantitatively there are some differences between the Bohr result and the exact result. And uh, basically, we have this, uh, the energy levels will be quantized just like the uh, energy levels of an, in an atom, for the electrons in an atom. So when you have these closed orbits, the energy levels are automatically quantized. And this is the quantization condition in the xy plane. Then, then the next problem is what about the degeneracy? So you see, if you have these circles, this circular or orbit, you can have a circular orbit over here or another circular orbit over here. And essentially, they will have the same energy because just shifting these orbits shouldn't change the energy of, your, of my system, especially if my system is infinitely large which basically means that there is a degeneracy in the system. Now, one way to obtain this degeneracy was to look at the area of these orbits. And if you look at the or area of these orbits, the areas are actually quantized in some area quantum, the areas of in, in the Bohr approximation, of course. Then you can just reason that if two orbits are to be separated, then they should differ, their, uh, the area that they cover should differ at least by this area quantum. And if you have this approach, let's say, then the number of different orbits, different states that you would obtain by just shifting a given orbit, should be given by the total area of your system divided by this area quantum. Now, this is one that's an in intuitive way of obtaining this degeneracy. So this is the area, the area quantum divide by, divide the total area by this area quantum and you get such a number for the degeneracy for a given energy. <coughs> now another way of approaching the same problem is, you see, in the absence of magnetic field, you have definite momentum states as your energy eigenstates. And there is a continuum, assuming almost a continuum. Now, when you put your system in a B field, what happens is the eigenstates are no longer uh, definite P states, but they are superpositions of them. And it just turns out that at least the result tells us that the superpositions are such that they are degenerate in energy. Now, so one thing you can say is, okay, so uh, I had all these momentum states. They just converge to a single state. Now, if you have n states, to m states, they say here in this range, and you can actually form m independent superpositions of those states. And hence, the degeneracy of this single state should be the number of states in this range. And now you can just count the number of states in this range. The number of states will be just the integral over the phase space 
for states in this range, but this, the states in this range should have an energy between this energy, let's say half below this energy level, let's say zero energy, up to the first excited state, or from just below the uh, j state and up to below the j plus first state. So this, this is the number of states that corresponds to a given j, let's say. And when you do the, all the calculations, etc., you basically ob obtain the same result. So this is the de degeneracy of a state of a given j. Now, so, so now we know how to sum the, sum the uh, summations. So let me just take these two results. Or let me just take this result. If I'm summing over single particle states, this will be my sum. Now, any questions in this discussion? Uh, you said that um, we made an approximation. You said more uh, approximation. But um, it's, I mean, as an hydrogen atom, it's something like atom, right? Mm -hmm. Do we get the same result if, uh, if we apply Schrodinger's equation or something? You see, this is the exact result. This is the exact result. Mm -hmm. This is not the Bohr result. The Bohr result is this one. It's just this coefficient multiplied by an integer. Exact result just gives us not any integer, but an odd integer. I mean, uh, in fact, this is a, I mean, if you haven't done this, I do advise you to solve this uh, Schrodinger equation. It's a nice exercise. You see, if you, you can have, you can use quantum mechanical solution. You, if you have b in the z direction, then you can choose your vector potential such that ax should be 1 over 2 b0 y, ay is 1 over minus 1 over 2 b0 x. And then your Hamiltonian. Let's say P minus uh, QA squared over 2. In fact, you can write, you can define four operators A, A dagger, B, B dagger. In terms of these uh, X, in terms of XY, PX, PY such that AA dagger commutator is equal to BB dagger. Commutator is equal to 1 and all other commut commutators are 0. So these are nothing but your ladder operators in, the, in a harmonic oscillator setting. And furthermore, your Hamiltonian takes this form, H bar omega 0, AA dagger plus 1 half. You see, okay, so this is nothing but the harmonic oscillator. And if you look at the exact solution of the energies, these are just the uh, harmonic oscillator energy levels. And the second thing you should note is that in Hamiltonian, the operator B doesn't appear. So basically, H commutes with B or B dagger. So you can create a state of a given j and let's say another number n as a dagger to the power n j b dagger to the power n acting on the vacuum divided by square root of j factorial and square root of absolute value of n factorial with the understanding that b, da b dagger to the power minus 1 is b. <coughs> you see, energy doesn't depend on n. So you have all the de degeneracy due to this operator b. Now you see these operators are in fact uh, a, a dagger. You can just, uh, or let me say, 
you can first define some px to be px minus qax and some other x operator is just py minus qay with certain coefficients. And just define px tilde again with certain coefficients, this time px plus qax and x tilde to be again some coefficient times py plus qay. You can fix those coefficients so that px and x and px tilde and x tilde satisfy canonical commutation relations and px and x commute with px tilde and x tilde. And in terms of this px and x, the, the Hamilton, in the Hamiltonian you only have px and x. And the Hamiltonian just takes a harmonic oscillator for in terms of px and x. It's just px squared plus x squared. So it's just a harmonic oscillator in two of those oper new, newly defined operators and the other operators do not appear. So the A and A dagger are defined in terms of Px and X, just like the ordinary harmonic oscillator, and B and B tilde are defined in terms of Px tilde and X tilde. Okay, so let's go back to our uh, problem at hand. By the way, just, you can just go how to solve this uh, two-dimensional problem. You can also try define z as x plus i y, z bar as x minus i y. Two complex coordinates, you can define the pz and pz bar. and try to write down your Schrodinger equation in terms of this z and z bar and pz and pz bar and see what the equation is. It will be easier to solve. So since you are mathematically oriented, both of you, I think you will enjoy this, this class, both of these uh, derivations in your spare time. Okay. So back to our problem. This is uh, what we have in the canonical. Let's say th this is the if if we would like to do in the canonical, in the grand canonical case, uh, we can def we should define the logarithm of Q, the grand canonical partition function, which is equal to sum over uh, logarithm of one plus z e to the power minus beta epsilon, which is And this is our epsilon. Now, first, let's look at the high temperature limit. Now, you see, high temperature limit is when z is much, much smaller than 1. Now, high temperature, again, just means uh, much larger than Fermi energy. So the, then logarithm of 1 plus z e to the power minus beta epsilon is approximately z times e to the power minus beta epsilon. You just put it over there. This is equal to logarithm of q is approximately in the t much larger than the Fermi temperature limit. This is just the integral from minus infinity to infinity log lz dpz over h sum over j from 0 to infinity, 
Lx Ly Eb over Hc times Az times e to the power minus. Well, let me just copy this term over here. at the PZ integration, it's just a Gaussian integral, which can be easily evaluated. If you look at the J summation, it's just a harmonic series, something to the power J, J summed over zero from zero to infinity. So let me just skip those uh, computations and, okay, I didn't copy it, so let's just calculate it. This is equal to, well, I have LX, LY, and LZ products, so that is the volume of my system. Then there is the EB over HC, Z. Uh, there are H squared over CZ. One H over here, another one over here. Uh, the PZ integration will just give me square root of 2M pi. This is my PZ integral. You see, it's uh, uh, 2m pi over beta. And then I have sum from j0 to infinity, e to power exponential of minus beta e h bar b over mc to the power j multiplied with exponential of minus beta e h bar b over twice mc. <coughs> this is equal to v e b over h c z. Well, you see, this factor is nothing but 1 over lambda. No, it's just lambda. No. You see, here I have kt. Just move one of these h's over here h over this one, this square root, is nothing but my thermal wavelength. So I can just use 1 over lambda to shorten my expressions a bit. Then I have this exponential of minus beta e h bar b over 2 mc. And this sum is just 1 over 1 minus exponential of minus beta e h bar b over 2 mc. Now let me make some definitions so that it will simplify it a bit. Let me call mu effective is e h bar over uh, two m c. Ah, you see, we had this spin, and the spin was uh, well, this is the Bohr magnitude, by the way. This is h bar for an electron, and then I let me call x. as all the remaining parts. So here I have E h bar over 2 m c beta mu effective b. Then my, the grand partition function is just v e b over lambda h c. Let me just keep these factors. And here I have 1 over e to the power x minus e to the power minus x. You see, I just moved it to uh, move this to the denominator, and this is what I obtain at the end. And this just becomes, if you put all the factors, okay, so this is uh, VEB over lambda HC, Z, 1 over twice sine hyperbolic x.
So we have the grand partition function at the large temperature limit. Now what we need would be, let's say, the magnetization, for example, that is what we will, well, let, let us also calculate the number of particles. So we, are, we would like to express everything in terms of our number of particles, eventually, rather than z. Well, the number of particles is just z derivative with respect to z of logarithm of q, keeping everything else constant. If you, keep, if you remember in logarithm of q, z appears with the power n. So if I take the derivative with respect to z, it brings down a factor n, but lowers the power of z by 1, so that's why I'm also multiplying by z. So that, that gives just the z times the probability, n times the probability summed over the probabilities, that derivative, so that's the average n. Well, I know what q is, just take the derivative, and in the low temperature limit, this is z v over lambda q, <coughs> x over sine hyperbolic x. And then we have a, we also need the magnetization. Okay, to calculate the magnetization, what we need to do is, uh, you see, take the der if you take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the uh, magnetic field, that, that derivative, you see, the Hamiltonian contains minus the magnetic dipole moment dot B. If I take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the magnetic field, then that derivative is minus the magnetic dipole moment. Well, that's why I have that minus sign, so that minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to B is the magnetic dipole moment, and magnetization is nothing but the average magnetic dipole moment of my system. And this is equal to a 1 over beta derivative of logarithm of Q with respect to B at Z, V, and T. You see, logarithm of Q contains e to the power minus beta times the Hamiltonian. In Q, sorry, not the logarithm of. In Q is just the sum of such terms. e to the power minus beta times the Hamiltonian. And the only thing that depends on the magnetic field is the, Hamilton, the, ed, the Hamiltonian or the energy levels, let's say. So if I take the derivative of this exponent with respect to B, that basically brings down a minus B, minus beta. <coughs> That's why I'm dividing by minus beta and then the derivative of the energy with respect to B. So that is what I'm trying to evaluate. And we already have that, the logarithm of the grand partition function. And so this, if you just put all the results, M is Z times V over lambda cube, mu effective, one over sine hyperbolic X minus X cosine hyperbolic. Well, these factors are not that important, but just for completeness, let me write them down. And so the magnetization is just, you see, here in average n, I already have this z v over lambda cube terms. There I have the sine hyperbolic over x. So if I just, uh, I can just write m as minus n mu effective this Langevin function, you see this Langevin function cotangent hyperbolic x minus 1 over x. Mm -hmm. So if you just factor out x over sine hyperbolic x from this parentheses, what remains is minus this function. So basically, all the temperature dependence is over here. If you have a fixed number of uh, electrons, the temperature dependence is in this in this function. Now, the crucial thing will be, of course, this this is a negative number. So that's why we are we call it a diamagnetism. The magnetization is negative. If you want the susceptibility at the large temperature limit, just take the B goes to zero limit minus n mu effective squared divided by 3 kT. <coughs> well, you see, the difference p 
all the paramagnets. Is at large temperature, this was n mu b squared or mu star squared <coughs> divided by kT. Well, there is a sign difference. There is also this uh, fa difference of a factor of three. But basically, they have essentially the same form. Well, in the classical limit, we had already seen that the, the, the susceptibility should go to zero as one over t. And the total magnetic susceptibility, uh, you see, you are not really separating these two effects. So if you have a gas of electrons, you just put it in a magnetic field, there will be both of these effects. You cannot really just turn one of them off and keep the other one. So the total susceptibility will be just the sum of these two. Well, this one is due to the spin of the electrons. This is due to the orbital motion of the electrons. And then, okay, this is what happens at large temperature. We can just look at what happens at low temperatures. You see, if you look at this, uh, if you just go through our steps, the high temperature limit we mainly use going from this summation to this expression by just uh, replacing, expanding this logarithm for small z. That's where we use the high temperature limit. At an arbitrary temperature, we cannot use the, really use that approximation, but what we can do, we can still convert the summation into an integration by using such an approximation. J from zero to infinity, this is actually approximately well, usually what we'll do is from just convert that to an integral. Most of the time, this is just a sufficient approximation for us. Well, if you want to go one step further, this is just 1 over 24 derivative of f with f prime 0. Do you know how to obtain these approximations, by the way? Uh, you see, the nice, the trick over here is to convert uh, uh, any summation over integers to an integration over uh, complex numbers. You see, we have been looking at these functions, e to the power 1 over e to the power x minus 1. Where are the poles of this one? Where are the poles of this function? for integer n. So it's there, they are in the compl uh, complex, along the complex line. So it has, a, if you just integrate this around the complex line, the residues correspond to integer values of n, and the value of your integral is basically the sum over the residues. Now each residue corresponds to an integer. So it, by using this, uh, our, this uh, reasoning, you can convert any sum over integers to an integration over the uh, complex line in the complex plane. But this <laughs> is just nothing but more or less our Fermi function. And we already know how to approximate the Fermi function, the integrals of Fermi function. So the trick is basically start from such an integration, such a contour. Uh, start with the integral of this Fermi function over a contour and then deform it to the real line. We know how to approximate the integral along the real line. That's a neat trick. Okay, so let's go back to our result. Okay, this was our summation.
This is the energy we have. <coughs> Now, you see what happens if we just replace that summation by an integration without changing anything else. From j, from zero to infinity of logarithm of one plus, or let me just uh, write the pz integration also. Let me just look at the integral. Now, with, the, with this approximation, we can just write this as from minus infinity to infinity, dpz, dz, dj, of logarithm of 1 plus z exponential of minus beta e h bar b over mc. Uh, now, this is, let me just replace it by x x plus pz squared over 2m. Plus, from minus infinity to infinity, dpz. Well, the next term is 1 over 24. Derivative with respect to x of this term evaluate that x is equal to 0. Now let's look at the first term. The first term I can just change, make a change of variable, x goes to x over b. So the first term, the b here is cancelled. And then I have a 1 over b in the first term. But if you look at the full expression for the logarithm of the grand partition function, it is proportional to b. And then here there is a 1 over b, so basically in the logarithm of q, there is the first term that <coughs> I obtain by replacing the summation by an integration is independent of b. So if I want to calculate, let's say, the magnetization, which is the derivative with respect to b, it is just this term. So this is equal to logarithm of, let me say, q, evaluate that b equal to 0. No. Not necessarily. Let's say q 0. This is independent of b. Plus some other function of b. And the magnetization, since we had already said that this is 1 over beta, derivative with respect to beta of logarithm of q, the grand partition function, it is just this term that contributes. Well, okay, you just do all the uh, tricks, etc., and well, you, you just get uh, some. Yeah, the rest is kind of straightforward. I, I just would like to skip. But the meta ideology is basically this one. So you have the once you have, you need to evaluate this pz integral over here, which can be evaluated. It's not a, such a, a complicated integral. So you, you obtain the logarithm of q in terms of which you obtain the magnetization. You can also obtain the number of particles, etc. Now, in our remaining time, I just would like to sketch some other applications of this formalism. Now, one of them is white dwarfs. You see, we had this uh, short discussion about white dwarfs and neutron stars. Okay, white dwarfs are stabilized by electron, ele electrons 
Fermi pressure. Whereas neutron stars are stabilized by nucleons from the pressure. Neutrons. So basically as the star collapses, if the electronic pressure is enough, so that's where it stabilizes. If it's not enough, then the star starts collapsing, mm -hmm. then the nuclei start to dissociate into their nucleons, the protons and the electrons, they, they convert each other to uh, neutrons, so you have your system mainly made up of neutrons. And eventually if the mass is not huge enough, you get the, the neutron pressure, which stabilizes your system. Now, just some numbers about these neutron, these white dwarfs. The mass is, well, some typical numbers, is, let's say, 10 to the power 33 grams. Now, the, in these white dwarfs, you, in a star in general, what you have is it's just a, a huge uh, sphere of hydrogen to start with. And then it burns hydrogen, which becomes helium. And white dwarfs are mostly made up of helium when the hydrogen runs out. And the uh, <coughs> density of the system is 10 to the power 7 grams per centimeter cube. Typical uh, density. The uh, central temperature is of the order of 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. Now, keep in mind that the one electron volt is of the order of 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. So this is of the order of 10 to the power 3 electron volts. This is the uh, temperature at the center, typical temperature at the center, which is the hottest point. Now, if the temperature is so high, this temperature is high enough to ionize the helium. So basically, all the helium is ionized. So we have this uh, gas of electrons, free electrons, they are ionized. And then we have uh, inside this gas of uh, electrons, the nuclei are uh, buried. Now we will be interested in the pressure. The nucleons are very heavy. So the pressure that they exert will be much smaller than what the pressure, the pressure of the electrons. So we can just ignore it basically. Now let's look at the, well we know the, uh, let's, what about the Fermi energy of these electrons? Now, to determine the Fermi energy, we need to determine the, the density of electrons. Well, the mass of the star is, equal, let's say, n is the number of electrons. Then the mass of the star will be n times the mass of the electron plus, well, the electron is uh, every helium nuclei just emits two electrons. So the number of helium nuclei we have is just n over two. And the mass of these, each one of these helium nuclei is four times the mass of the proton. <coughs> so the total mass is n times mass of the electron plus twice the mass of the proton, which is typically n times twice the mass of the proton. Or if we know the mass, the mass, the number of electrons in my system is the total mass divided by twice the mass of the proton. So since I know the mass of the white dwarf, I know the mass of the proton, I know the, the number of electrons there. Well, that I know that some typical radius, and I can just go ahead and calculate the, I know the Fermi energy, you see the Fermi momentum of my system is just 3n over 8 pi to the power 1 third h. I know the number density. 
I know the pi is just a constant, h is just a constant. So this, if you just put in the numbers, this is a number of the order of 10 to the power minus 17 grams centimeters per second. This is the Fermi momentum. If you look at the mass of an electron and multiply it with c, this number is of the order of 10 to the power minus 7, 17 gram centimeters per second. So Fermi momentum is of the order of Me times c, which tells me that they are moving at relativistic speeds especially the electrons at the Fermi level, they are moving at relativistic speeds. So the energy of my system I should take into account the relativistic effects. So this, this is the energy of, an, of the electrons in my system. Now, from the Fermi momentum, I can calculate the Fermi temperature, Fermi energy, and hence the Fermi temperature. And the Fermi temperature turns out to be of the order of 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. You see, the temperature of my system, the hottest part of my system, is at the temperature of 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. Whereas the Fermi temperature is 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. So this is a very cold system. This is of the order of 10 to the power minus 3. This is a highly degenerate gas of fermions. So I can just, instead of the Fermi-Dirac function, I can just use the uh, step function. Now the pressure. If you remember uh, our earlier discussions about the pressure, we had also looked at the pressure from a kinematic perspective, just the motion of the particles around. And we had obtained the result that the pressure is one third the number density of the particles and the average of p time, the pressure, the momentum of the particles multiplied by the speed of the particles. This was the expression we had obtained for the pressure. And so this is equal to one over twice and the average is uh, dqp dqq over uh, hq and then we have the p is p u is a uh, the epsilon by dp and then just put the step function That step function is R my Fermi Dirac distribution. And it turns out that this pressure, now let me just write down the answer. Some some constants times some function of what's called uh, X. And X is actually PF over MC. Okay, as I said, I'm, I'm not really interested in all the exact uh, computation, but so we can actually calculate the pressure of the gas. Now the problem is, so what about the size of the system? What can we say about the size of the system? You see, if, if there was no gravity, we have a system with pressure, if we want to keep it confined, we had to put some walls around it. The walls would keep them. But since now we have the gravity, gravitational attraction, there is the pressure pulling my system out. There is plus the, uh, this uh, gravitational attraction that is pulling my system in. So the question is, when is it stabilized? So when it is stabilized, is the, let's say if you have a small variation in the energy as a function of the radius, this should be zero. The energy would be minimal. Well, there will be two contributions to the energy variation. One is due to the pressure, the other one is due to the gravitational attraction. So DE will be, let's write DE, DE0. The, due to, this is due to the pressure, this will be minus P0 dV. Well, we already know what P0 is. This is minus P0 times 4 pi r squared times dr. Due to gravity, 
this will be the derivative of the gravitational energy with radius times dr. But this will be nothing but Newton's constant m over r squared with some proportionality constant. Well, that proportionality constant will, of course, depend on how the mass is distributed, whether it is uniform or not, etc. All the details about my system. But this alpha will be some number of the order of 1. If you assume it's uniform, if I'm not wrong, it's that alpha is just 3, five, three over 5 or something like a number like that. Well, dE, which is the change in the energy, is just the sum of these two, which should be zero. But this already tells me that P0 should be alpha over 4 pi when the equilibrium is reached. Alpha over 4 pi gn, the mass over r to the 4. You see, if you go back to, OK, here there, there is x. Okay, now, let's look at this relation. What does this equation tell me? The right hand side depends on the mass of my star and the radius of my star. The left hand side is the pressure, but the, if you look at the pressure, the pressure depends on this parameter x, which is, the, which the, which is nothing but, which depends on the Fermi energy. If you look at what the Fermi energy is, well, Fermi energy depends on the number density which is a function of the radius. <coughs> so if you consider the mass and the radi radius as your free parameter, this is a relation between R and M. So for a given, all the other parameters are the mass of the proton, mass of the electrons, etc. Uh, they are constants, they are known constants, and they are fixed constants. The star has some mass, and uh, uh, depending on this mass, it will have some radius. The radius of this neutron, this white dwarf, will be de uh, determined by the mass. And the relation in this, tip in this simple picture is given by this expert equation over here. Now, of course, the pressure, you can just put the expression over here. There was this function A of x. You can expand it in various limits. Let us look at the limits. Now, one limit, well, one typical value, or, or let me write the final expression. A. Yeah, this is the final expression we have. This is the final relation between the radius and the mass that needs to be solved to determine the size of the white dwarf. Well, there are some interesting combinations over here. This is the mass of the star in terms of the proton mass. Here we have this radius of, my, of the system in terms of the electrons, the Compton wavelength, which is h bar over mc. Here the, we have the gravitational potential energy of the star in terms of the electrons rest mass. And this is again the, the size of the star in terms of the, the Compton wavelength of the electron. So it's, you have all these quantum mechanical, gravitational, and relativistic concepts uh, intermingled in this expression. Now, this, all these numbers over here, we al I had already given some typical number of the mass of a, a neutron star, h bar, mc, they are all constants. This number is of the order of 10 to the power 18. So we can have two various limits, 10 to the power 18 uh, centimeters. 10 to the power 8, sorry. So we can look at the limit when the radius is much larger than this 10 to the power 8 centimeters. 
And it turns out that in this case, the mass, the radius is proportional to mass to the power of minus one third. The second limit is when the radius is much less than 10 to the power of eight centimeters. In this case, the radius is, let's say, let me write, proportional to mass over m proton to the power one-third, one minus m over m zero to the power two-thirds, everything squared with some proportionality constant. Now, the thing is, what does these limits tell me? You see, if we look at the large radius limit, and if we increase the mass of the white dwarf, the radius of the dwarf decreases. If you look at the lower limit, the other extreme, in this case also if we increase the mass of the white dwarf, the radius of the white dwarf decreases. So actually in both limits, whatever the radius is, if you increase the mass of the dwarf, the radius of the dwarf decreases. So that's one thing we have. The second constraint is, you see, the mass, okay, as you increase the mass, the white dwarf decreases, but the mass cannot go above some sort of limit. Well, this is just 9 over 64, 3 pi over alpha cubed, etc. <coughs> Basically, for a mass larger than this one, there is no solution for R, no real solution for R. So there is an upper limit on the mass of a white dwarf, because if the uh, mass of the white dwarf goes above this limit, then the Fermi pressure of the electrons is not enough to stabilize the gravitational attraction. And it turns out that, okay, this is a very crude approximation. A more precise formulation basically gives us the mass around 1.4 the mass of the sun. So if the mass of a star is larger than uh, 1.4 of the mass of the sun, then it cannot form a, a white dwarf. So you have all these concepts uh, playing together to make some predictions about white dwarfs. Mm -hmm. Do you say the same sentence please, as you said? You see, if the mass is larger than m0, mm -hmm. look here, this uh, mm -hmm. number is larger than 1. So 1 minus that number becomes a negative number. You don't have a solution for the radius. Mm -hmm. There is no radius in which the star will be stable. So for a mass larger than m0, we cannot have a white dwarf. So it continues collapsing, becomes a neutron star. And this expression over here, I mean, up to here we made very crude approximations, like we assumed that the electron density was uniform throughout the star, which is not true. We ignored all density variations everywhere, which is not true. Within this uh, very crude approximation, we have this expression of M0, but you can do a more precise uh, modeling of the neutron star, and the current limit is just this one, some typical number. Any questions? Well, let us do one more step. I mean, I will just sketch it. Let's get these two phen phenomena. Now, thermionic emission is the emission of electrons from a metal due to the heat of the system. If you heat the system, eventually it will start emitting electrons. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, it will start emitting electrons. In the photoelectric effect, you have the light helping the electrons to be emitted. Now, if you look at metals, uh, they have a, a, a very simple picture of a metal will be just like a, a potential well. 
This is your metal. This is outside metal. Because basically the electrons are more or less free to move inside the metal, but they are not allowed to go outside the metal. <coughs> and the Fermi level will be somewhere over here. This is what's called the work function. Well, this is the Fermi energy. And this whole thing is... Now, let's consider what happens to an electron that hits the boundary of this metal. You see, this is our metal. This is outside. Now, the electron will have some momentum. Let's say this is the z-axis. Assuming it, can, it, can, it has enough energy to go out of the metal, after it leaves the metal, it will have the momentum. Well, you see, the force is acting in the z-direction only. So the x component and the y component of the momentum will not change. So it will have a, the momentum px, py, but some other pz prime. And, well, you see, in fact, you can obtain a, some kind of a Snell's law from here. P times, let's say, if, let's say this is theta, uh, theta prime, this is theta, P times sine theta should be equal to P prime times sine theta prime for the electrons. This just means that the horizontal component of the momentum should be the same. P times sine theta is the horizontal component of the momentum. Now, if we use the energy conservation, you see inside the energy of the electron is... Let me just fix the here to be the zero potential. Inside will be 1 over 2m px squared plus py squared plus pz squared. Outside, it will be 1 over 2m px squared plus py squared plus pz squared plus w. Now, energy should be conserved, so both of these terms should be equal to each other which basically tells me that pz prime squared over 2m should be equal to pz squared over 2m minus w. This should be larger than 0, because pz prime squared over 2m should be larger than 0 if the electron is, has moved out of the metal. So pz squared, pz should be larger than or equal to square root of 2m omega for the electron to escape this uh, potential well created by the metal. Now, <clears throat> if we want to calculate how many electrons are coming out of the metal per second, per unit area, well, we just need to find out how many electrons are hitting a given area uh, per second with the condition that pz is larger than this 2m omega. Well, if you remember, this is nothing but we had something we had already done when we were looking at the radiation emitted by a black body. <coughs> and let me just write the final result. <coughs> the rate of the electrons, that's the number of electrons hitting unit area per second is given by this integral. Of course, we need to impose the condition that pz should be larger than or equal to the square root of 2m omega. The lower limit of pz is square root of 2m omega up to infinity. There are no limits on px. 
or py. And then we have the, the well, sum over all the states that satisfy this property. Oh, sorry. For each momentum, we have two electrons spin up and spin down. There is the phase space unit volume h cube, one over e to the power epsilon minus mu, divided by kt plus one, the Fermi Dirac distribution, times u of z. And then once you obtain this number, you can obtain the current as just the charge of each one of these char charges times r. Well, the, the relevant case for us will be the temperature is much lower than T Fermi. Now, of course, if the temperature goes to zero, temperature is much lower than epsilon Fermi, but nevertheless, temperature is not zero because if temperature is less than zero, all the electrons have energies less than E Fermi, which, does, which is below the uh, this, uh, depth, the height of the potential well, so none of the electrons can go. But if we increase the temperature, there will be some electrons excited and there will be a tail of this Fermi Dirac distribution. And that tail can contribute to the current due to heat. And let's see, if in this limit, nevertheless, temperature need not, should, shouldn't be zero, but it doesn't have to go above the Fermi energy. And the, the current, turns out to be 4 pi m e k squared over h cube. Well, some just constants t squared e to the power minus omega minus epsilon Fermi divided by kt. You see, omega minus e Fermi is just the work function. Let's just say phi. Well, temperature is still typically of the order of, uh, at room temperature, temp T will be, well, you see, phi is also typically of the order of electron volts, just like the uh, Fermi energy, just a couple of, a few electron volts. So room temperature at least is much lower than the, this phi. So phi over kT, or let's say kT over phi, is much, much less than one, typically, at room temperature. So this is the, it, there is a current, but nevertheless, this is extremely small. And keep in mind, again, that here we are ig ignoring the fact that, let's say, just take a metal, any metal. This relation tells me that, okay, there will be a very small current, but there will be a current. But we don't observe currents in the, just some uh, metals at room temperature. And the reason is, if you just have an isolated metal and just remove one electron from it, the metal is now charged with the opposite charge, so it will just attract it back. But if you just connect your metal to a, a circuit, let's say, so you have your metal and connect it to a circuit, Or let's say, let's say you have two metals. And connect, there is a gap in between. You just put some, uh, connect them to a battery. If, there is, if you remove one electron from one of the metals, then no problem, the battery will provide that electron so the metal will keep uh, neutral. And so in, in this case, you can still have currents running from uh, one end to the other end. Of course, the electrons will hit the, if it's not vacuum, the electrons will hit the, uh, at the uh, atoms in the, in, this con in the container. And <coughs> hence, you won't really measure, a, uh, you won't really obtain a measurable current unless you go to very high temperatures and you create a vacuum over there. But even at very low uh, potential difference, 
Yeah. Okay, there, there are other things that will come into the game. We are basically creating an electric field here. Now the next question is what happens if we have an, add an electric field to our system? Let's say we have, we have your, our metal, put it in an electric field with magnitude f. Let's say this, is, this axis is x. What will happen in this case? Can we rip electrons? What will be the current? Well, let's look at what, how much energy will change. Let's say, let's assume we have an electron over here and an electron over here at a distance x. What is the chain difference in the potential energies of these two points? Hmm? You see, uh, it's this omega, if you go back, this omega was basically the difference of the potential inside my metal and outside my metal. Now, if you look at this case, <coughs> there will be omega, there will be an Ex or Fx, plus there will be some uh, E squared over 4x squared, the met if the metal is charged, if neutral. So you, you take away one electron, if you take away one electron, it becomes charged. So there's an image charge on the other side with plus x. And the charge and the image charge are separated by a distance 2x. Oh, sorry, this is uh, 2x. the potential energy is still 4x. As you keep in, just consider this case, you have an infinite metal plate, you put a charge in front. There will be an image charge at twice the separation. Okay? So, hmm? now the separation between the image charge and the actual charge is twice the distance between the uh, plate and your charge. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you might be tempting to say that the potential energy is 2x. But keep in mind that you can interpret the potential energy as energy stored in the electric field. But in this metal uh, and point charge system, the electric field is only in half of the plane. So it's not really a charge and an image charge, it's just half of it. So the potential energy is also half of it. Okay, you see, we are, we are trying to calculate the potential energy between a plate and some charge separated out, put outside. Okay? This is what we are looking for. Now, uh, you will say that, okay, there is a corresponding image charge on the other side, minus Q. So the potential energy should be Q times minus Q. If this is X, this is also X divided by 2X. But keep in mind, here the electric field is non-zero. But here the electric field is zero. The potential energy is actually the energy stored in the electric field. But only half of the space has an electric field compared to the case of two point charges. So that's why we have to divide by two. Now what does this do? You see, if you look at this delta as a function of x, As x goes to zero, it goes to minus infinity. As x goes to infinity, it again goes to minus infinity. So the potential basically has such a form. The total potential. Now there's a maximum of the delta, which is given by omega minus e to the power 3 over 2 f to the power 1 half. So what this does is effectively lowering the uh, barrier height. So the current would be just in the 
in the presence of an electric field will be the current in the absence of the electric field multiplied by e to the power. Uh, let's, let's see. So phi is also lowered now. So e to the power e to the power three halves f to the power one half divided by kT. So if you have sufficiently large electric field, you can just uh, enhance the current by exerting an, uh, uh, an electric field. So this is basically what happens over here. If you want to get a current running through that gap, what you need to do is apply an electric field. That's what the potential difference does. It will also keep the metals neutral. You see uh, here, this is true if Let's say it's grounded. And you have to also need to create a vacuum so that the electrons will easily go through. Now, let, let me just do uh, what we have in the case of the photoelectric effect. The main difference will be, you see, before we had this constraint, Pz squared over 2m should be larger than omega. This is due to the energy conservation and due to the fact that the uh, x and the y components of momentum do not change. So their contribution to the total energy is the same whether the electron is inside or outside. So they cancel from both sides. Now, if you write the energy conservation now with the uh, uh, photon coming, well, the photon has an energy h nu. So this, this is the main difference now. And you can, again, look at various limits. Uh, of course, in this case, the low temperature limit will not be enough. Will not be enough because there is also a parameter new, which will change all the treatment. Well, you can look at various limits. If the new is larger than new zero, well, that's what we usually study as a photoelectric. Uh, new zero is, uh, by the way, defined as is five. In modern physics books, you say that the photoelectric effect starts when nu zero is such that it is enough to overcome the work function. So this is when uh, nu is larger than nu zero, and the difference is much larger than the temperature. Well, basically, you don't expect the temperature to have any effect. So it's still at low temperatures. Nevertheless, this condition is set. It should be satisfied. And so the current you obtain will be typically 2 pi m e over h nu minus nu zero. And just a word of reminder, in this treatment, we are not taking into account any quantum mechanical effect, except on the fact that we are dealing with fermions. You see, the actual experiments show that the, uh, the current doesn't really change with frequency, it changes with intensity. And the, we can have the other limit, nu is less than nu zero, but still the difference is much larger than kT. You see, here I'm not writing uh, the expression because the expression we have for the current is basically exactly the same as this one. The only difference is that the lower limit is different now. And then in this extreme, the current is 4 pi m, well, the same constants. Well, it's almost the same thing as our previous expression, but the work function is now reduced. So before it, it was just minus phi, there is now this h nu minus phi, or phi is replaced by phi minus h nu, because already some part of that energy is given by the photon, the electron should have the remaining energy. Okay, so uh, I would just end here about the applications. Questions?
in photo vector to be equated with, let's say, we are applying uh, potential uh, to the place, and but the light has uh, energy which is lower than the work function. Is it possible to make a photoelectric current of that? Is it? The uh, electric field, the effect of the electric field, just like the discussion over here, it, one thing, it lowers the effective barrier. Uh -huh. The second thing it does is, uh, in this treatment at least, we still only to take into account the electrons that have energies above this barrier, so that we are saying that they will contribute to the current. But there is another effect, tunneling. So if, if, if you apply an electric field, even a small one, you see, if your electron is over here, in this treatment we are not taking the contribution of that electron. The same will hold for the photoelectric effect also. But this electron, although in this treatment we are not taking into account, it can just tunnel through. And hence create a current. If you apply an electric field, of course, the tunneling will not happen if there is no electric field, mm -hmm. because the potential is just uh, constant outside. But if you apply an electric field, the potential will be linear. It will be decreasing, at least in one direction, in some direction, it will be decreasing. And hence, uh, if, even if you have an electron whose energy is below the barrier height, it can tunnel through. But of course, this will be much smaller if there is the other current. The tunneling uh, goes exponentially small, ex is exponentially suppressed by this width that it has to tunnel. So even if nu is... Okay, so there are basically two things. If nu is smaller than uh, what is necessary to overcome the work function, you will still get current at finite temperature, because of this tail of the Fermi Dirac distribution. That is one contribution to the current. Secondly, you will get current from tunneling if you also apply an electric field. In the absence of the electric field, you only get the uh, current due to this tail of the Fermi Dirac distribution. Mm -hmm. You see, this, uh, this thermionic emission You can just consider it as if new zero, as low as it can get. You still get a current. Why? Because the Fermi Dirac distribution at finite temperature has a tail that goes to much higher energies. Of course, it will be exponentially suppressed, just like we have found over here. But nevertheless, it's non-zero. Basically, you're saying there can be some electrons which has high energy to reach the other. To overcome this barrier. Mm -hmm. Although you don't have enough energy as a photon. Yes. Mm. Now, the electric field makes it even easier because of this contribution. One, it will lower the barrier. Secondly, it will allow for a possibility of tunneling. So then that's the end of the semester, midterm will be, you will have your midterms next Wednesday in the evening, around 5 probably, you will have 36 hours at least to just do it and either send me the written copies or just take a photograph and send me the photographs. And then we will also have a final. The final uh, will probably be in class if you are all here. So, see you around.